I'm Megan Kelly live in New York City and tonight. New fallout tonight after America's top law enforcement officer shares a shocking message suggesting that states only really have to enforce the laws they like. Plus, when did you learn that the uh, people won't be able to keep their plans? A sneak peek tonight at the road ahead for some Democratic lawmakers as they desperately try to hold the Senate. And then drama at the custody hearing of a Massachusetts teen taken from her parents as the same group that fought in the Terry Schiavo case now steps in. Nothing is being done to teach her to help her. Tonight, Justina's father and the folks who defended Terry join us on their new campaign. Plus, a controversial bill in Arizona puts big government on a collision course with religious freedom. Britt Hume is here to show us what the stakes are. Breaking tonight, what is being called an unprecedented approach as a presidential administration already under fire for writing its own laws now tells prosecutors across the country they can ignore some of the laws passed by the states if they see fit. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megyn Kelly. For weeks, we have tracked the growing controversy as the Obama administration comes under fire from both liberal and conservative legal scholars concerned about what is being called a lawless presidency, extending its power well past what the Constitution allows. Today, a new twist. As America's top law enforcement officer, Attorney General Eric Holder, now tells a gathering of attorneys general from across the nation, these are state law enforcement representatives, that they only have to really enforce the laws that they believe in, that they believe are constitutional, and can decide to ignore those they think might be discriminatory. Republican Congressman Tom Rice is set to testify tomorrow at a House hearing on the president's recent rash of executive actions. But we begin with Jonathan Turley, who is a constitutional attorney and a professor at George Washington University Law School and a, and a supporter, somebody who voted for President Obama. Professor Turley, this is, this is quite something. Uh, under Republican administrations and Democratic administrations, attorneys general have decided in rare instances not to defend a law on the books. But to then pull in the state attorneys generals and say, and you should consider doing it too, in particular the question is on, on gay marriage, um, whether this is a bridge too far for Eric Holder. Your thoughts? Well, I find it pretty troubling, not because he's speaking to his state counterparts. The federal attorney general will occasionally reach out to his state counterparts and they will try to coordinate their position on policy. The problem is not giving advice, but the specific advice that he's giving. Uh, you know, many of us were troubled by the role of Attorney General Holder and the administration in the last challenge that ended up in front of the Supreme Court involving DOMA, the Defense Against Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, the administration left that litigation in midstream and refused to defend the federal law. And it created a pile up in the courts. It was not clear who could defend the law. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened with the sister case from California, Hollingsworth where ultimately the court found that there wasn't standing uh, to be heard in front of the Supreme Court. That's the price of this tactic. If you withdraw your defense from these, uh, of these laws as attorney general, there may not be someone there who can advance the case. So, for, so it's like these, yeah. these laws are almost like criminal defendants who get a state-appointed lawyer, but in their huh. case, the state-appointed lawyer doesn't show up and nobody else has the power to step into his shoes. And so big shock, these laws tend to fall. That's what's so troubling because, you know, I happen to agree with the president in this area, but I did not agree with how they handled DOMA in these cases. I think that as lawyers, we have first and foremost an obligation to the legal process. We should have a full and fair hearing of these issues. There's good faith arguments on both sides. Right. I just don't agree with one side. Why, but, but, John, you, but, but Eric yeah. Holder is, is saying, you know, he, and he said at the federal level, what was unusual about what he did at the federal level when he chose not to defend the defense of Marriage Act was he had been defending it for a year and a half and then right. suddenly he went in and said there is no good faith basis on which this could be defended and that was unusual because he had just been defending it for a year and a half and now all these state AGs have been defending a law that has been passed on their books by their constituents signed into law by their governors and now he's sort of with, with a wink and a nod saying to them Maybe you guys don't have a good faith basis to defend those laws which were duly passed by electorates. 
That's right, and what people need to remember is that attorney generals assert the absolute right to be the sole defender of these laws. So when they leave, when they are sort of absent without leave, there is no one there. I felt what Holder's mistake was, and this is why I think his advice was bad today, is that he didn't create a substitute, somebody that would guarantee a full and fair hearing. He was just saying, you know, pull the ladder up behind you. Mm -hmm. And that's a serious problem for the separation of powers. You know, DOMA was duly uh, enacted by Congress and signed by Bill Clinton. And this is a problem that Congress is facing. I'll be testifying tomorrow at the same hearing as the congressman. And this is one of the issues we're going to have to deal with mm -hmm. uh, because it is a serious problem when someone says, I alone can defend statutes um, as, as the representative of the United States, and then he's just not there to do it. And, and I declare that this statute is indefensible, and I don't care what the people of my state have said or what the governor signed into law. And in many of these states, the attorney general is of a different party than the sitting governor, so you can see some politics may find their way into it. Professor Turley, we look forward to hearing your testimony tomorrow. Thanks, Megan. All the best. And so he, you heard, is going to testify before uh, on Capitol Hill about these power grabs we've been watching at an executive level. The president's use of executive orders and executive action has really caused a lot of consternation in the country from both the left, as you saw with Professor Turley, and the right. And Congressman Tim Rice is a Republican out of South Carolina and author of a resolution titled, quote, Stop This Overreaching Presidency. It's pithy. He's Hello, being called. To, yeah, we think. Good to see you, sir. So, you, Professor Turley's going to go and he's going to talk to Democrats in particular and try to urge them to find a way to challenge this president. Now we see it not just at the presidential level, but even at the attorney general level. I mean, it's hey, if you, I know that the state legislatures pass laws and the Republican governors or the Democratic governors sign them into law, but I, as the attorney general, and we, as the state attorney general, we will tell you which laws are good and which laws are bad, and you know. To hell with you if you don't like it. Well, Megan, that's what our stop resolution is all about. Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution, in my opinion, is pretty clear that the president shall take care to faithfully execute the laws of the land. The president ha doesn't have the right under the Constitution to pick and choose what laws or parts of laws he's going to enforce or who he's going to enforce them against. And the, our president has shown a pattern of doing this over and over again, particularly with the Affordable Care Act. So and it's Representative Tom Rice. So um, my, my question to you, though, is what are you going to do? Because we've had Professor Turley on the program before uh, who has said repeatedly the problem is how do you force people to abide, people in the White House, I mean the president, the attorney general, how do you force them to abide by the Constitution and limit their own powers? Well, Article 2, oh, excuse me, the stop resolution, House Resolution 442, if passed by a majority of the House of Representatives only, would, uh, the House as an institution would bring a lawsuit against the President to enforce his obligations under the Constitution. Okay, so you, you try to get a judge to declare that the President has done too much? That's exactly right. You know, the president, and, and then, just and like then I who did, enforces he took that oath. order? If the judge issues it, who enforces that order against the well, White House? Well, if the judge finds the president's actions unconstitutional, then those, then those actions will be null and void. So the, the, you need somebody that, to enforce it. Who would that be? Someone who worked for the president. Well, you know, if the president, if the court finds that the president's actions are unconstitutional, then I guess Congress could go further. But uh, uh, initially, what we've got to determine, you know, nobody argues that the president doesn't have any discretion, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the president's got some discretion. But here, particularly in the area of the Affordable Care Act, when he delays the employer mandate for now two years, you know, the, I'm a tax lawyer and a CPA. The Supreme Court has ruled in holding uh, the Affordable Care Act constitutional that these mandates were a tax, right? The president has no right to, uh, to delay a tax. He has no right to say that this group well, of people doesn't we, have to pay the tax. We've established the controversy over those behaviors, but we have not established the, the path forward for lawmakers like you who want to who wanna challenge it. I mean, I think it's interesting well, okay, you're looking okay, into well, it, and, we're, and, and even the Democrats uh, are so starting for to pay example, attention. On, on, on the employer mandate, I, I gotta if, go the Supreme so if, if the Supreme Court rules that, that, that his decision was unconstitutional, right. that man, mandate will apply retroactively. We shall see. We're, we're interested to watch what happens on Capitol Hill as you hold a hearing tomorrow. Sir, thanks for being here and giving us the Thank preview. you, Megan. We're also digging into a stunning headline today from the FDA. Federal health regulators are now debating a technique that would allow babies to be created from the DNA of three people, not just two. And that is being called the dawn of designer babies. 
and the implications are mind-boggling. Trace Gallagher has more from our West Coast Bureau. Trace. And the hope of this technique, Megan, is to someday eradicate mitochondrial disease, which can cause epilepsy, blindness, and other factors. The Oregon Health Science University says it has already used this technique to produce five healthy monkeys. They want now to begin testing it on a small group of women who carry the defective gene. And here's how it works. Only the mom carries the gene, so they use mom's egg, but they take out the mitochondrial DNA and use a donor's mitochondrial. Baby gets mom and dad's traits with the donors healthy DNA. Supporters call it gene correction, but critics call it gene modification with a big time social and ethical concern that will lead to designer babies where parents can pick eye color as well as things like intelligence and height. Now they believe it could lead to unintended disease down the road. They say, and I'm quoting here, this is a biologically extreme procedure that puts any resulting children at serious risk and that breaks a long standing international consensus against producing genetically engineered humans. They say the FDA would be the first government to ever approve this. Others say yes, there are risks, but that you cannot let the fear of the so-called brave new world stop medical progress. Here's Dr. Art Kaplan. Listen. It's a different issue to say, hey, I want to figure out if I should use this to make a taller baby or a stronger baby or a smarter baby. This may open the door to doing those things, but I'm not sure you can hold the babies hostage and say we're not going to fix diseases because it might lead to a slippery slope. We should note the parents of Justina Pelletier say that she has mitochondrial disease and whether she has it or not is at the center of this custody debate between them and the state of Massachusetts. The FDA so far, Megan, has not really tipped its hand, but experts say they believe they will allow this in small trials. Wow. Megan. All right, Trace. Thank you. Also tonight. When did you learn that, that people wouldn't be able to keep their plans? It may be the most telling press conference we've seen since the Obamacare rollout. Watch tonight as one top Democrat fights to defend her votes and her Senate seat. Plus, a Kelly file investigation after we learned the VA has been destroying thousands of medical records as a way to deal with the backlog of troops not getting help. So they wouldn't let us do a mass purge, so it's just a matter of getting in there and canceling them ourselves.